Welcome to the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast. Business advice so easy, you'll feel like you're cheating. And now your host, Amy Porterfield. Hey there, Amy Porterfield here, and welcome to a bonus episode of the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast. This episode is all about the GDPR. Now, GDPR stands for the General Data Protection Regulation, and it's a privacy law from the European Union that goes into effect May 25th, 2018. I'm recording this about a month in advance of that deadline because as online entrepreneurs who attract an audience to our website and from there build our email list, we have to pay attention to the GDPR. Now, if I had it my way, this regulation would go away today. It's a pain in the butt, to be quite honest. However, we do have to pay attention. So I thought, I'm going to find a really educated lawyer who knows all about the GDPR, and I'm going to find someone who can break it down in layman's terms so we all understand what we need to do now before the deadline and what we need to do moving forward as we collect data on our website and build up our email list. I found just the perfect person to break it down for us. His name is Bobby Klink. Isn't that just a great name? So Bobby Klink is an intellectual property attorney, but he's not your typical lawyer. Sure, he went to Harvard Law School and he worked at some of the most prestigious firms in the country. But if you look at the big whiteboard in his office, you won't see much about the law. His whiteboard is filled with tasks related to platform building, inbound marketing, and sales funnels. Bobby is a full-fledged online entrepreneur whose area of expertise is the law. He helps other online entrepreneurs safeguard their online businesses. I first met Bobby inside of my Insiders Club. He is a student of List Builders Lab. How perfect, right, for the GDPR. And he's also one of my B-School bonus members. He was one of the very few gentlemen that joined. And let me tell you, I always say men that join B-School are the smartest men out there. So they always get extra attention in my groups because there are very few men. And also, he has really made it his mission to support my B-School bonus members with understanding not just GDPR, but everything you need to understand as an entrepreneur, as it relates to protecting you and your community online. So I won't make you wait any longer. We are going to bring Bobby on and we're treating this as a mini workshop. When you are done listening to this episode, you are going to understand what GDPR is all about, how it affects you as an online marketer, what you need to do now with your website and your list building efforts to get ready for the deadline, and then what you need to do moving forward so that you are GDPR compliant. It's not as bad as it sounds. However, you do need to understand it and take some action right away. I'm taking action inside of my own business. I'll be sharing my journey with you, but this is the start of it. Let's get educated on what it's all about. All right, let's dive in. Bobby, thank you so very much for coming on the show. I am so excited to have you here today. Well, thanks for having me, Amy. I'm excited to talk about this subject and to help your listeners and students really understand what they need to know about the GDPR. Uh, It's time. It's time to dive into it. But before we get there, tell me a little bit about you and your background. I'd love to. So, Amy, I started as a really normal lawyer who knew nothing about business. When I launched my law firm like four or five years ago, my idea of marketing was I talked to other lawyers, I wrote articles for other lawyers, and I networked for other lawyers. I kind of missed the part about how you should be talking to your clients. (laughs) Um, but you know, I slowly but surely transitioned and, uh, you know, nowadays I spend all my time really working with entrepreneurs and trying to help them understand the issues that affect them. And especially in the online entrepreneurship space and help you them understand how it's just a little bit different. And there are these different rules that we have to live by than a brick and mortar business does. For sure. And I love your mix. I know I said this in the intro, but I love your mix of being an entrepreneur and having this legal background and really understanding what 
online entrepreneurs need to do to protect ourselves. So you are the perfect person to have this conversation. So are you ready to dive in? I am ready, although, you know, let's not say we're excited, but we're ready to talk about <laughs> I know, about we shouldn't GDPR lie, race. right? I shouldn't be saying excited. I'm excited <laughs> to finally get the facts and put it out to my audience, but I do not love this topic, and I've been very honest about that. It's not my favorite, but we've got to do it. We're adulting yep. today. We've got to dive into it. Yep, good idea. <laughs> okay, let's do it. So we're going to start at the top. What is GDPR? GDPR it stands for the General Data Protection Regulation. It is a new law that goes into effect in the European Union. And I say I say new. It's not new. It's been around for a while, but enforcement starts on May 25th of 2018. And so now is the time everybody's ramping up and getting ready, getting compliance in effect before that May 25th deadline. And although it's a European law, it affects really all of us, unless you are someone who doesn't touch any data or any individuals in Europe, you do have to worry about it and make sure you're ready to comply. Okay. Now, what activities are covered by the GDPR? The GDPR is about, and what it covers is any time that you're doing what they call processing of personal data. And processing here is just a fancy word for doing anything with data. It literally defines it and it has a long list and everything from the point you collect it until you delete it and everything in between is covered by the GDPR as processing. So anything you're doing with data from collecting, storing, using, and anything else is included. And then the other piece is it only applies to personal data. And personal data, though, isn't just personal data. It's anything that is associated with or related to a person who's identified or who you can identify. So there's a couple of things in there that are included. Obviously, personal identifiers like your name, your email address, your address, any of that's included. There's also pretty widespread agreement that your IP address, if you don't, if you get the whole IP address, would be included. Although Google Analytics has a workaround where they're going to kind of delete the last three digits there. So all of that stuff's included, but it also includes any kind of processing and information that you're adding to your contact database. So think about if you have quizzes. If you have tagging, if you have segmenting within your CRM database or anything else, all of that's included because what you're doing is effectively monitoring what people are doing. And if you're monitoring what people are doing, that's included. So I like to use the example that in my email system that I'm using, I have a system where instead of it automatically doing lead scoring for me, what I do is I set up automation. So every time someone opens an email, it adds a point. And every time someone clicks on a link in an email, it adds another point. That way I can kind of see and track how active my subscribers are. All of that is included and covered by the GDPR. Uh, It's a lot. Okay, so moving on then, who does the GDPR apply to? The best way to think about it is that if anyone involved in a commercial relationship and even a free commercial relationship is in the European Union, it applies. So an important thing to keep in mind is it's not citizenship, it's not residence, it's where they are when you're interacting with them. So what this means functionally is for an online marketer, one of your listeners or students who is in the European Union, it applies to everything they do in their business. 100%, every transaction, every piece of data they touch is covered by the GDPR. For folks like you and me who are not in the EU, though, it applies to us when we are interacting with or collecting data from people in the EU. But it gets a little bit more complicated than that because there are some carve outs if you're not doing certain things. And I know you're going to get to that, but basically what it comes down to is, are you making offers to people in the EU? If so, you're going to be covered. Gotcha. So how does it apply to non-EU entrepreneurs, which is a very big bulk of my audience? Yeah. So as I I mentioned, it applies when they are interacting with people in the EU, but there are some exceptions, right? So what the, the GDPR says is that it applies to processing that's related to either offering products or services to people in the EU, and that would include offering free products and services. So lead magnets, those types of things are covered as well. 
or if you are monitoring the behavior of people in the EU. Now, this is one of the areas where there is some gray area. And I've had a lot of people ask me, well, can I just avoid the GDPR by saying on my website, I don't offer anything to folks in the EU? And the answer to that is it's not clear. Unfortunately, there's not a clear answer to that one way or the other. I mean, I'm kind of a pretty typical example here. My products and services are really tailored to folks in the United States, not in the EU. When I do Facebook advertising, I only target people in the United States. But when I've looked at my list, I have about 5% of my list is people in the EU. And candidly, would I say they couldn't buy one of my products? No. Would I say they couldn't download a, a lead magnet? No. So I think I'm covered and I have to comply with the GDPR with respect to those folks. But some people have said you might be able to avoid it if you really did put in some real limitations and refuse to do business with people in Europe. But I don't think most of us are going to do that. And so if you're not, you're going to have to comply with it, at least when you are interacting with and how you're handling your data for people who are in the EU. Got it. Okay. Now, there are six principles of the GDPR. Can you quickly walk through those principles with us? Glad to. So the first principle, and really this is the one you're hearing about the most, it's that data shall be processed, and this is a quote, lawfully, fairly, and in a transparent manner. So there's a couple of parts of that. One is lawful. So you have to have a lawful basis for doing it. You have to be fair about it, and you have to be transparent. So you have to tell people what you're doing so they can make a decision about that. The second principle is that data shall be collected for specified, explicit, and legitimate purposes. In other words, I can't just collect data for some reason that I might use it in the future. I have to tell you what am I going to do with it. I have to be explicit, and it has to be a legitimate purpose. So that's the second principle. The third principle is that data processing shall be limited to what is necessary for the purposes. And this has a couple of elements to it. One, you can't collect every piece of personal data about a person to give them a lead magnet because you just don't need all of that information. So you have to minimize what you're collecting. But then also, once you have it, you have to limit what you're doing with it to what is necessary for the purpose for which you collected it. So if you collected it to deliver any lead magnet, you can't then use it for everything in the future. And we're going to talk about that more when we get into the list building part of this training. Now, the fourth principle is that data shall be accurate, kept up to date, and corrected. Luckily, that doesn't really apply to us. That's more for the Googles and Facebooks of the world, where basically they're supposed to make sure that they're keeping data that's accurate. The fifth principle is that data shall be kept in a way that it identifies the actual person no longer than is necessary. And again, this means if I collect the information to make a sale and I don't have any other purpose, I can't keep it for 100 years or 50 years. At some point, I have to get rid of the information that identifies the person. And then the final principle is that data shall be processed in a manner that ensures appropriate security. This shouldn't be a big deal for us. We should all be using SSL certificates and other ways to actually make sure that we're protecting the data. But you have to do that. You can't just have your data in an unsecured method anymore under the GDPR. Got it. I love learning from you, Bobby, because you make it so clear and like I could actually understand this. So just an early thank you for this. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Look, this this is this is a complex subject and it's like 250 or 260 pages. Oh so it wasn't God. a lot of fun to go through it, but at least I'm trained to do it. Yes. And you can talk about it in such an easy way to understand, which is exactly why I chose you to do this. So thank you so much. Okay. So from the training, and I mentioned this in the intro, you have this really cool three-part free video series we're going to talk about at the end. But from your training that I went through, I know that to collect, store, and use data, including names and emails, you must be able to demonstrate that there is a lawful basis for the processing of the data. So can you talk about how that relates to online entrepreneurs? Yeah, glad to. This is actually really the big point. So this is where the big headline comes from. And the big headline is that we're going to have to change the way we go about collecting email addresses from potential leads, at, at least for our marketing efforts. Because the only real lawful basis that is going to give you the right to market to someone under the GDPR for any long period of time is going to be if they give you consent. 
And consent under the GDPR is higher than what we've been operating under for the last five, 10 years in the online marketing world. It requires that consent be freely given, specific and unambiguous, and also like at a very granular level. So consent for one thing doesn't mean consent for everything. So there's a couple of pieces of that and what that means. Under the new standard, the big thing to know is we can't just automatically add everyone who grabs one of our lead magnets and add them to our general marketing email list because they have not given us freely given specific and unambiguous consent for us to send them those marketing emails. So what we have to do is get a separate consent to add them to our marketing list. So not just send me the lead magnet, but also you're going to have to get a separate consent to add them to your marketing list. And in that, an important thing that a lot of people thought, oh, well, I can just get around this. And this was what I thought at first before I really dug into the law. I thought, oh, well, I'll just put something in that says, as a condition of getting my lead magnet, you have to consent to allow me to add you to my marketing list. That's not allowed under the GDPR. The GDPR says you cannot, and again, it doesn't say it 100%, but my read of it and everything I've read from guidance from others is you cannot say you only get the freebie if you'll consent to something else. So what we have to do instead is we have to find a way to sell our prospects on why they want to be on our email list and convince them that they want to sign up voluntarily for our list, not just because we're going to require it as part of getting our lead magnet or getting some other freebie or signing up for a webinar or some other training that we're doing. We have to sell them on the benefits. Now, the other big part that people need to understand and that a lot of people aren't thinking about and why you need to be taking action now is that this new consent standard applies to your existing list. So if you can't show that you have the right kind of consent for people who are already on your list and to whom the GDPR applies, you have to stop emailing them come May 25th. So you need to kind of take some action between now and then to make sure that you are compliant. Okay, so that's the big thing here. We've got to do some work up front before May 25th, and then we have to have something in place so that we are staying compliant as we add new people to our email list. The great thing is that we're going to break that down. And we're going to give you some suggestions as to what you can do now and moving forward. But before we get there, I've got this question. So what if I want to send a nurture sequence after somebody opts in for a lead magnet? Because I teach that you don't just have someone sign up for a freebie and then you say, okay, here you go, and you're done. So what can I do under GDPR? Well, again, Amy, I wish I could give you a clear Ugh, answer. It just kills me. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is one where what I'll tell you is when I started really diving into the GDPR, I found different answers from different people. Some people said, absolutely no question, you cannot send any kind of marketing email because someone signs up for a lead magnet. All you can do is deliver the lead magnet. That's what some people said. Other people said, yeah, you can do these short nurture sequences leading to a sale. When I looked at it, what I would tell you is, I think there's a good argument for being allowed to make these nurture sequences, but it's not crystal clear. So the GDPR has a provision that talks about expanded processing, basically processing data beyond the original purpose for which you collected it. And it gives this list of factors that you would consider in deciding whether you're, whether that's okay to do the expanded processing. And so one of them is the link between the purposes of collection and the purposes for the expanded collection. So is there a clear link between why they gave you their info and why you're sending them this later email? The next one is the context in which the data is collected. I don't know what that means, quite honestly, but I think it means, you know, are you collecting it freely? Is, is it, are you putting some pressure? But you could think of different meanings to it. The nature of the personal data that's collected is another one. So luckily for us in, in the space of a lead magnet, we're not collecting really personal data. It's a name and an email address. So we're not collecting something that's very sensitive. Another factor is the consequences of the expanded processing. And for a nurture sequence, what's the consequences? They get, what, three, four emails from you right. over a week or two? You know, that's probably not something that's that bad. And then the last factor is whether you have appropriate safeguards in effect. 
And you should have those in, in, in place no matter what. So when I look at those factors and I think about, for example, right now, one of my lead magnets is a guide about the different policies you need on your website. So someone who downloads that, they clearly need, probably need these policies or at least have some concern about whether their policies are good enough. So I have a short nurture sequence that would lead them to template forms. It seems like I'm serving them and I'm not hurting them in any way, shape or form by doing that. I honestly haven't decided whether I'm going to continue with nurture sequences if I can't get a separate consent, but I think there's a good argument that you're allowed to. Gotcha. And when you said that last bullet point, existence of appropriate safeguards, would a safeguard be like a privacy policy on your website? Yeah, that would be part of it, but also just general safeguards to make sure that the actual processing that happens isn't going to put them at risk. Now, one thing we have to remember is the GDPR, it's not all about emails. The GDPR is about all kinds of processing of data. So it's about what Google does with our data or what Facebook does with our data. And so we're having to, to look at this much broader law and say, well, how does it apply in this very specific context? And the important thing here is because all you're doing is sending them a couple more emails, you're not really changing or putting the data at risk in any other way. Whereas you could see if Facebook collected it for purpose one and then all of a sudden transfers it to this other place for a different purpose, there might be some extra risk. So the question would be, are there safeguards? That one I think is always going to weigh in our favor on gotcha. this point. Okay, cool. Okay. So here's the big question. What do I need to do for list building? Well, I think you foreshadowed it a little bit ago. There's what we need to do to preserve our existing list. And then there's what we need to do going forward to collect emails and consents in a GDPR compliant way moving forward. So I think we need to break it into first, what do you do for the past? And then second, what do you do going forward? Okay. Gotcha. So here's the deal. What's the tactic to get compliant? Okay. So for your existing list, it's two or three prongs, really. Basically, what you need to do with your existing list is figure out who do you have to get a consent from, and then you need to figure out a way to do that. So what I would say is for people outside the EU, your first step needs to be to segment your list between your subscribers who you can clearly say are not in the European Union. And then the second category is subscribers who either are in the European Union or who you can't identify. And so you don't know one way or the other. And if you don't know where they are, they are you should just act as if they're in the EU. And so the GDPR will apply to them or apply to your interactions with them. The good news is a lot of the service providers are rolling this out. Amy, I think one of the email providers you talk about is ConvertKit. They have built this functionality in awesome. where you can search for people in the EU based upon IP locations. Most of the other service providers have it. I'm using Kartra, which is a new system. It's got IP address location, so I can sort that way. But I think all the providers likely will roll that out in hopefully the next week or so, but we're still waiting for some of the big ones to say what they're going to do. Okay. So you're going to segment your existing list. Now talk to me why the segmenting is so important. Well, because ultimately what you're going to do is for the people that you need to get consents from, you're going to do a re-engagement campaign. You're going to try to get them to consent between now and May 25th. And Amy, I think you'll know better than I will, but we are not going to get 100% or anywhere close to 100% to re-engage in consent. I don't know what your open rate is. My open rate hovers at 15, sometimes 20% if I have a right. really good subject line. Right. And my click rate, not nearly as good. And so the reality is that you're going to lose a lot of the people that you're sending this re-engagement campaign to because they're not going to consent. And so by segmenting, because remember, the GDPR for folks like you and me, it only applies to how we interact with people in the EU. We can continue to do all of the same things we've been doing in the past for folks in the United States, Canada, anywhere else that's not in the EU. That just doesn't affect those relationships. So by segmenting, what we're going to do is we're going to basically say, okay, our folks who are not in the EU and we know that, we're not worried about them. We're keeping them on our list. In my case, I did some 
segmenting based upon the portion that I could segment. And something like 63% of my list, I could clearly identify as not in the EU. Were you so excited? (laughs) I I was excited. The the bad news is I've got two legacy providers and one of the legacy providers has not yet rolled out this capability. Uh. In their system, I can see the IP address. So we could do it if, and they won't even let me export that data. That's uh, oh, that's so a fight for another day. Yes. But for at least this part of my list, I was able to segment. So I said, okay, this 63%, I get to keep that. You're good to go. I, yes. 5% are in the EU, 32% couldn't identify one way or the other. And why so, couldn't you identify those? Because for some reason or another, the system just doesn't have the data. Gotcha. Um, I'm not technical enough to know why. I'm not either. <laughs> I'll tell you is if you're using a new system, the problem is you probably so if you've kind of taken your list mm. uh, over time, moved it, you maybe didn't bring in the data to identify where they're from when you went to a new system. I don't know why that applies because I think I mean I'm talking about convert kit and it's I think was the first system that I really used actively to build my list, but it may be that some had come in through zaps or something else where I brought them in and it just didn't port that data over. Gotcha. I think we're all going to deal with that. We're running my list right now, so I'm going to find out. But okay, so you ran this segmenting and you got these numbers. Now that you have the data, how should you run a re-engagement campaign? Well, so what I'm doing, there's two parts to my re-engagement campaign. First, Everybody on my list is getting extra value and has been for the last almost month now. I'm normally sending one email a week where I tell people about my new podcast episode coming out. But what I'm doing now is I've added a second email each week. And this is a pure give. I'm giving them something of value. So I created a new lead magnet recently and I didn't ask him to opt in. I just gave it to him. said, here you go. And then when I launched this training, first I invited people to the training about the GDPR live. And then the second email I sent them on my list, I sent them an email to the membership area where they can go now and access the training. So I'm just giving them a ton of value. The reason why is I want them to say, I want to stay on this guy's list, at least the people who are opening it. That's the idea. Yes. So you do that, you build the goodwill. And then you have to just start sending re-engagement campaigns. And you'll have to figure out how you do this within your system. Either you set up a new opt-in page somewhere. There's just a very clear opt-in that says they're opting in to stay on your list. Or if your system is more advanced, it may be that them just clicking on a link will be good enough for you to mark that and store that data. But you have to get a consent. So what I'm going to do is start sending emails on a regular basis to that list come May. I'm going to start sending them to the people who are either in the EU or who I could not identify and try to get them to re-engage. I haven't decided on subject lines. Early on, it's probably going to be kind of tame, but eventually I'm going to start using subject lines like you would in a re-engagement campaign where I say, I'm going to delete you. And it'll get more and more dire as we get closer to the deadline. And what I'm going to do is come May 24th, Everyone who has not opted in, I'm deleting. I'm just getting them out of my system so that they're not there. There's no question that I'm not storing, using, or otherwise processing their data. I like it. I think it's just an easier way. You don't have to worry about it, and you're just moving forward now. Yep, and that's the plan. That's uh, Again, it helps because if they're not going to engage with me over a two-month period, they're pre- probably not going to be my ICA anyway. Right. That's a good point. So this is a really great opportunity to clean up your list as well in some way. And also a lot of my students will ask how I'm going to do this. We're still working out all the specifics based on what we've learned from Bobby, but because I use Infusionsoft, most likely we will be sending multiple emails as Bobby suggests here, and people will click on a link letting us know they want to stay on my list. If they click on that link, I could then tag them to be somebody who has given us their consent. But we're still working out on the details, but I just wanted to give that information. Now, one of the things that I really like is when you were talking about this re-engagement campaign, Bobby, you were saying that you're sending multiple emails and you want to be really mindful of the subject lines and you want to have some fun with this and still stay on brand. Now, when I say have fun, that means if your brand is fun, but you want to make sure these emails are written in your voice. You want to have really catchy subject lines so they see it and they open it up. You could just straight out call out the GDPR because they're probably very aware of it or you could play around with different things. But Bobby, you said you're sending multiple emails 
And you might get even a little bit more, I don't think the word is aggressive, but more inventive with those subject lines as you get going, right? Yeah, I think that's right. I think early on, it'll just be something about the GDPR or, hey, I want, you know, want to check in. I, I haven't decided yet. I'm still working on those. But as we get closer to the deadline, I mean, I may play around because I try to be playful in my emails. I try to lighten things up because I tend to be talking about serious subject matter. So I'll probably, you know, say something about like, I'm crying because I'm going to lose you or, or things like that, that maybe will get people's attention. Because I think you and I both know the challenge is getting people just to even open the email. And so I want to give every chance. So I'll do things like that. But then I will say, I'm going to send the, you know, I'm deleting you from my database if I don't hear from you. And and then maybe it's, no, seriously, I am going to delete you from my database just to make it clear and to really, you know, kind of up the ante there. Some people may send a, you know, do you hate me email if that's on brand for them. That's probably not what I'll send, but I'll send some playful things, but also tell them in the subject line very clearly, I'm going to delete you if you don't respond. Yeah, I think we need to be really straightforward at that point. Okay, so Bobby helped me write some notes about summing this all up before we move on to the next step. So here are Bobby's recommendations as we just went through them. Step one, build goodwill by delivering amazing value to your list between now. So as you're listening to this, I want you to find a day this week, carve out a few hours and totally focus on this. Chloe and myself and one other gal on my team, Rochelle, we're sitting down and we've blocked out hours to map this out to see how we're going to implement. You have to give it the time it needs. So again, build goodwill by delivering amazing value to your list between now and then. I'm talking about going above and beyond the normal value that I'm sure you deliver. Make your content so good that no one will want to miss the opportunity to stay on your list. Now, step number two is to create your list of targets from whom you need new consents. So this is the whole segmenting. For entrepreneurs in the EU, this will be your whole list. For entrepreneurs outside of the EU, which is most of you listening, this will be everyone in the EU and anyone whose location is unknown. All about segmenting in step two. Step three is to run a re-engagement campaign to the list of people who need to provide fresh consent. Sell them on the benefits and do this in your own style. Good copywriting is still key here. You know your audience and you know how they will want to hear from you. You'll want to plan for a series of emails with increasingly interesting subject lines to make sure people pay attention and don't miss them. Finally, this is how Bobby wrapped us up here. Anyone who doesn't give the necessary consent by May 24th should be axed from your list. Remember, even storing or deleting their info is considered processing. So this work needs to be done before May 25th. Did I do a good job there, Bobby? I think you did. <laughs> Actually, though, I should I should add one other thing in the segment. Okay. Um, I can't do this because I've never had this. If you have part of your list who opted in cleanly to be on your newsletter, you can probably put them in the okay category. Oh, if that's you a had good like point. A, if you had a, hey, sign up for my newsletter. Those people have already given you consent to receive your, your marketing email. So they're probably okay. I just, I've never really had that. So Me neither. And what's so funny is I totally teach against it. I'm not right. a huge fan of saying, sign up for my newsletter. I don't think it's as powerful. But anyone who was doing that is probably like, oh, I'm so glad I did it. Yeah. And, and the thing is, though, you have to be able to identify that that's how they signed up. So if you have that kind of data and say, this is how they signed up, you're good. You can treat them as if they've already given you consent. So you can put them in the OK file. Great. That would be taking some serious segmenting steps beforehand. So you truly know that's how they came in. But if, if you're organized, you might just have a chunk of your list that you don't even have to worry about, which is awesome. Yep. OK. So moving on, what do I need to do moving forward in my list building efforts? Okay, so because we are now at the point where you can't just add people to your list because they download a freebie or sign up for a webinar or something like that, I think we have two choices. One, we go back to the old join my newsletter, which I know you're not going to suggest, Amy, and I wouldn't either. Or we continue to use lead magnets, but get consent somewhere else else along the funnel. Now, I also want to point out another option here that's quick. If you don't care about people outside of, for example, the United States or the United States and Canada, you could also just decide if you can segment later, you're going to just 
do everything as normal and then just delete anybody who's not in those countries. That's another option you have available to you if you want your list to be 100% people outside the EU. But ultimately what you're going to need if you're going to continue to market to people in the EU and going to allow them on your list is to get a consent from them somewhere along the way. And that consent will be good as long as you tell them, hey, I'm going to send you marketing materials. I'm going to you know, try to sell you things. And you can do that with a privacy policy, which we'll talk about later. And so that's the way you do it is you got to find a place to get them to consent. So we're going to go back to having to sell them on the benefits of getting on our list. Gotcha. Okay. So with that, what would the workaround look like? Well, I've thought about this. I've tried to come up with different options. And the good news is we can still deliver our lead magnets via email. That's allowed because they've consented for us to do that, but it's also we're fulfilling a contract, which is one of the lawful reasons to process data. So the way I've tried to think about it is, okay, everything from the point they first interact with me until I deliver that delivery email, where could I put touch points in to try to get that consent? And I came up with four different places. First, you could put something on your opt-in page. And that's, you know, you'd put a checkbox or a drop-down menu, but but we'll talk about this in a second, I think. But you're going to have to make sure that they take an action that's affirmative. The second option, I'm calling a sandwich page. I'm not sure what the right technical term is, but it's the equivalent of like a one-cell or one-click upsell page in a sales funnel, but we're doing it in an opt-in where we're basically going to have a page between our opt-in and our thank you page where it is completely devoted to saying, hey, I'd like to add you to my newsletter list and you're going to sell all the benefits. You're going to use great copy and explain all the reasons why they want to be on your list. But you have that page where they're going to click a button to say yes or no, and then they move on in the funnel. The third touch point is the delivery email itself, where you could try to convince them of the value after you deliver their email or deliver the freebie. And then the final one is, and I think we should all start doing this, put something in all of our lead magnets that is inviting them to join our newsletter. And we should probably change all of our lead magnets so that it has a paragraph, has a link where they could go to sign up for our newsletter and then get on to our newsletter going forward. Love it. Okay. So I want to break this down just a bit to make this really actionable as that's what I've promised for this special bonus episode. So first let's talk about the opt-in page. Can you give us some pointers around that? Yeah. So what you have to keep in mind is there's a couple things. One, it has to be clear what they're doing, that they're going to give you consent to be on your marketing email list. It has to be their choice to do it. So a couple of things you can think about. You could do a checkbox or you could do a drop down menu on your opt in page that gives them the option to sign up for your list. Now, a couple of things. Number one, you cannot make it so that they have to agree to be on your email list to get the freebie. You also cannot default the choice to yes. They have to be the ones who go to yes. So either you default to no or you default to unchecked one way or the other, and then you do it. Now, what I would say is, you can, I believe, force them to answer a question. So if I were going to do this, I would probably, because of the way my system works, I would use a drop-down menu because I can make a drop-down menu that asks them a question, do you want to be added to my email list? And then you have yes or no. Again, I would try to do it in a playful manner instead of yes or no, because those aren't good from a copywriting standpoint. But I would force them to answer the question one way or the other. But I would make clear they're going to get the freebie no matter what. And then they answer it, I move on. If they said yes, they're added to my list. If they said no, I'm not going to do it. So that's how I would go about it on the opt-in page to make sure I was getting the right kind of consents. My system, a checkbox, if I put two checkboxes, they could check both. Uh, So I would not use a checkbox because I don't have that option. If you could use a checkbox where they have to pick one of the two, a yes or no, you could use a checkbox and do the same thing. So I want to point something out because a lot of my students said, oh, Amy's already compliant because on her homepage right now, I have the opt-in box and you can sign up for my freebie. And then there's a little box that said, hey, when you sign up, I'm just letting you know, you're going to get more emails from me and blah, blah, blah. I have some language around it. 
That is not compliant, guys. And here's what I've learned after going through Bobby's training. The reason it's not compliant is you have to check that box in order to opt in to, for my freebie. The actual freebie form won't move forward until you've checked the box that you know I'm going to send you emails beyond the lead magnet. And based on the GDPR, you cannot force that. You have to give them the opt-in or the lead magnet freebie, the option to opt in for the lead magnet, even if they don't want to be on your list. Bobby, this is all correct, right? That's right. Actually, the funny thing, Amy, you tricked me because I went to, <laughs> I went to your homepage and I, I just clicked because I wanted to see what you were doing. And I looked at it, but I didn't follow through. So I didn't try to click the submit. I just saw that you had a checkbox that I could check to say, yes, I want to be on your list. So I said, oh, she's actually done this. But then yeah. I think I realized someone said, no, you have to click it or you don't get the freebie. I said, oh yeah, that's not allowed. Not allowed. So th I did this well before GDPR just to make sure people knew what my plan was. I wanted to be more upfront with it, but I've got to change that all around. And so that's also custom. People ask me how I did that. I had a programmer customize it. But again, I've got to change the way I'm doing this. And of course, those members of List Builders Lab Yes, I have to update the program. Now that I know all of this and I'll implement it in my own company, the next step is to make sure List Builders Lab is compliant with GDPR. So I'm on it, guys. It just takes a little while to get it all in place. Okay, so Bobby went through the opt-in page. Now let's talk about the sandwich page and what that might look like to get GDPR compliant. So again, I, I call it a sandwich page. I don't know if you have a better word for I could, it. I've never had a word for it. So I thought that was such a funny name, but I thought, why is he calling it that? And then I realized, oh, I get it. It's sandwiched in it's, between. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that term used for, for kind of an intermediary page, but think of it, like I said, it's, it's like a one-click upsell in a sales funnel where you are going to try to sell them on the benefits of your list between the time they opt in and they get to your thank you page. The idea is people will see this, and so because they'll see it and they're not done yet, haven't gotten to the thank you page, they will actually respond. I think, Amy, you get you would understand this. Part of my concern with an opt-in, if it's not for, or if you don't force them to answer the question on the opt-in form, is they're just going to skip it. A lot of people just won't even pay attention. But the sandwich page really makes sure they'll do that. So I would treat it just like a whole additional opt-in page in the middle where you're going to talk about the benefits of your list. For example, what I would talk about, and I would do this anytime I could actually sell it, is I would talk about the fact that they're going to get tips, tricks, and strategies, that I send exclusive freebies just to my list, that I will give them the best pricing, the best discounts, the best bonuses, and anything like that I'm going to go ahead and put in. And I might even mention some examples of other freebies I've given to my list in the past to give them an idea of what they would be getting by being on the list. But again, Think about it like any other sales page where you probably have some bullets about the advantages and why they want to do it. And then you set it up based on however your system works, either as a button where they can maybe just click yes, or they click no, and it records which one they choose and then moves them forward. Or maybe you have to have just a whole separate opt-in form if that's what your system allows. But the idea is you present them with this, sell them on why they want to be on it, and then they make the decision. If they do, that's a clear consent that satisfies the GDPR requirements. Awesome. And Bobby's training that I'm going to give you guys a link to at the end, he shows examples of all of this in his own business, which is really cool since he does business like all of us. So you'll get to see some examples. Okay. Moving on to the delivery email. I like this one. So talk to me about how to make this get your consent you're looking for. Yeah. You know, Amy, my emails normally don't look like this. Normally my emails deliver and then it's a what this says about you because I, I am a member of List Builders Lab. You are a good student. So those of you who are not in List Builders Lab, we teach something called what this says about you, which is a special delivery email that packs a good punch, kind of screwing up our really good punch. I know. So talk to me about what you do now well, or so what you will do. So for these folks, what you can do with your delivery email is the way my traditional email was structured is I have a first line that it, I don't know, it says something about, hey, congratulations, I'm excited you download it and then whatever it is, then I've got the download link. And then I go into kind of the what this says about you, about how, hey, this shows, I'm excited. I want to say thank you on behalf of your future business. It shows me that you care about protecting your business. And then I go further down the line. What I've done or what I will do on this is I'll kind of stop there. This shows me that you want to protect your business. And then I'll say, as someone who wants to protect your business, I want to invite you 
to join my newsletter. And then the rest of that email, again, is a sales piece. I'm not going to make it long. I'm not going to make it drawn out, but it'll talk about the benefits of being on my list. The same things like, hey, you're going to get tips, tricks, and strategies. You're going to get free guides, checklists, and other goodies. You're going to get exclusive access to discounts, bonuses, and promotions. So I'm going to sell them on it. And then I'm going to tell them about something I just gave away for free recently. Then I'll have this thing about how I don't spam them. I won't rent. I won't sell. And I'll give them access to my privacy policy. And then I will ask them if they want to stay on my list and I will have a link. And originally my plan was to just tag people. But when I was messing around with my system, I discovered it's better. I'm going to have that link take them just to a standalone opt-in page to opt in to my newsletter. But I may continue to mess with that. However, you can get that and tag that someone clicking that link is giving you their consent to be on your list. So that's the email approach and that's how you can get consent from your delivery email. Okay. I like it. And then finally in the lead magnet, you alluded to this one a little bit, but give us a quick recap. Yeah. So again, I haven't figured out where I was thinking at the end of the lead magnet, but I might not put it. Yeah. I'm not sure if I want the end or not though, because I may not get there. But the idea is I'm going to put something in the lead magnet that tells them, you know, a short paragraph that says, you know, this is, you know, and again, I haven't worked out this yet and I have to because I have to work with my designer, but it will basically invite them to my list again, talk about the benefits and have a clickable link. I think this will be good because among other things, anytime they go back to look at that freebie, they're going to see it. So it may be a reminder to them to go ahead. Oh yeah, I want, I would actually want to do that. So it'll give you a chance. Again, it'll send them to a standalone opt-in page that is a, Hey, sign up for my newsletter opt-in. So, okay. I, and I like the lead magnet idea. I have so many lead magnets (laughs) that I don't know what I'm going to do about that. But I wouldn't just do that one. I really think that it could be a mix of a few of these. And I love how you talked about that in the training, how you might do a few like the opt-in page and the delivery email and in the lead magnet. And I like how you talked about doing it on the opt-in page and the sandwich page might be a little overkill. Depends on your audience, right? If your audience is used to seeing these things, if your audience is someone who goes through sales funnels with like five one cell, you know, upsells and down cells, that won't bother them. But for most of us, I think most of your your students and listeners, they're not used to that. So I would either do the opt in or the sandwich page. But actually, I do need to give a, a special piece of guidance here for folks who are outside the EU. If you're in the EU, you need to use as many of these touch points as possible. But if you're outside the EU, you shouldn't ask for consent, in my view, until the point in your funnel where you can start to segment. Because the question is, what happens if you do this on the opt-in page and then say someone from the United States doesn't want to opt-in? They don't opt into your decision or they just skip your sandwich page, but you could be emailing them under the GDPR. There's no problem. But all of a sudden you're in the pickle because they've kind of said they don't want to get it. Maybe it was in action. Maybe it wasn't. So I wouldn't want to add them to my list then. And I think we know that could be a problem. So I'm only going to use anything that comes after the point that I can segment based on are they in the EU or not. So with me and and my current system, that means I can't use anything until the delivery email. I'm not that worried about it personally because, again, my services really are really limited for folks in the U.S. I mean, someone outside the U.S. could use my products, but they probably wouldn't be using them very often. So in light of that, I'm not that worried about it, but you need to find where in your funnel you can start the segmentation process. If you can show different landing pages to people based upon their location, start there at the opt-in is what I would do. Oh, I like that. That's what we're going to look into with my team. If we could right away figure it out and then show different landing pages based on inside or outside of the EU. That is really optimal, but it's going to take a little workaround. So, or at least really understanding your email service provider and how it's going to integrate with all of this, but it's worth the extra effort and time to look into it because really what I keep thinking is I just want the list that is non EU just to move aside and be what it is right now. Like I don't even want to have to worry about all of them and just take the smaller segment of the EU and worry about them specifically. So as much segmenting as possible, I'm looking into it. Yep. Okay. So we are in the home stretch guys. I want Bobby to tell us a little bit about 
the role of the privacy policy related to the GDPR, because your privacy policy, which you all should have, has to change. So, Bobby, will you break it down for us? Yeah. So everyone should have a privacy policy because there's been a California law on the books since I don't, 2002 or 2003, I think, that basically says if you collect any information from anyone from California, you need to disclose certain things. So you should have a privacy policy already. But the GDPR puts some added responsibilities. And so part of what the GDPR says is when you are going to collect data from people that falls under this standard, you have to inform them at that point of you know certain things. And so the privacy policy is how you're going to do that. Because if you think about it, if you tried to write all of that information on you, on your opt-in pages, your opt-in pages would become, you know, long form sales letters with a bunch of legal gobbledygook and nobody wants that. So instead, what you do is you have a privacy policy. You, you make sure it complies with all the GDPR requirements, and then you can use that as the way to make sure that you are informing people at every point where you're collecting information from them. Gotcha. Okay. So what do I need to include in the privacy policy? So in the privacy policy, I can give you highlights. There's a lot of little things, but you have to give them the contact information for all the relevant people. This includes you or your company. And then there's some other people under the GDPR that probably don't apply or might not apply. One's called a GDPR representative and one's called a data protection officer. You have to figure out, and I talk about those in the training, if those apply to you. If they do and you have those, you need to identify them and give their contact information. So the first category, contact information for you and if you have either of these people them the next is what information are you collecting and why are you collecting it so what is it that you're collecting from them what's your basis for doing it etc and in this one thing you need to keep in mind is this is the stuff that you are getting because they voluntarily give it to you but also the things that you are automatically collecting so google analytics things like that need to be disclosed again you should have been disclosing that anyway but you need to disclose it. But you also need to explain why you are collecting those things and kind of what's the the legal basis. And again, that would be consent, or you're going to explain these things, for example, that you use analytics data to improve the performance of your website, which I think is the standard language most people have been using. Then you need to talk about what you do with the data. So this is where, for example, you need to tell them that, hey, if you consent, I am going to send you emails and it will include promotions and it will include things like that. But you also need to tell them if you're going to share the information with others. And you might think, oh, I'm not going to share it with other people. But you are. I mean, most likely you are not the one who actually holds your data. For example, my data is held by Kartra. Luckily, I now don't use a lot of inter integrations, but if you use Zaps that are transferring data from your email service provider to somewhere else, or if you're using any other complicated systems, you are in fact sharing the data with a bunch of vendors. Luckily, you don't have to identify them all by name. You either have to identify the recipients or the categories of recipients, but you have to tell them if you're doing those kinds of things of sharing it with outside vendors. And then the final area is there are certain rights under the GDPR that you have to list. These are kind of specific. They're put on a list. It's things like the right of erasure, the right to withdraw consent. There's just a list, and that is pretty straightforward. What I've done in my template forms that I have for people is I've literally just added a section right near the end that lists these. I think it's eight things that you have to include. Okay, got it. Now, just so everyone's on the same page, where do you put the privacy policy? Well, so where you put it is you should have a standalone page on your website where you basically literally just paste the privacy policy. That's it. You should do the same thing with all your other legal policies on your website. But actually, I do want to talk about one thing that's come up recently. A couple of people have asked me because they don't yet have a website. Maybe they are just starting to collect emails. So they've set something up in lead pages or I think one was talking about Launch Rocket. If you use one of those services, what you have to do is just create an additional page within whatever provider you're using where you put the privacy policy and then you can pull a link to that page. And the standard way we do this is on your website, you would have links to your privacy policy in your footer navigation bar. Nobody puts it in the top navigation, but they can get to it from your the footer. And then you do the same thing with any outside service. If you use lead pages, 
or I use Kartra, whatever it is, you are going to include it in there on the footer there as well. And then the last place you need to put a link, you need to put a link anytime you're collecting. So on your opt-in forms now, you need to have a line that essentially says you are going to treat the information consistent with your privacy policy and put a hyperlink on privacy policy. So anyone who wants to can go and get access to it. That would apply not just to downloads, but also purchases or anything like that, where anyone is giving you data, make sure you have a link to your privacy policy. So good. Okay, we reached the end of our mini workshop for GDPR. And Bobby, I cannot thank you enough for your time and generosity in helping us understand this little bit of a a monster situation. I, I can't sugarcoat it. You know it's not my favorite topic, but I feel really confident that I understand it now. So hopefully my my listeners feel the same way. Thank you for that. Well, thank you for having me on. Look, don't be too afraid of the GDPR. Once you understand it, you just start having to take some action. But if you take action, you can take care of it and and you don't have to worry about it too much. I agree. And for all my newbies out there, you're just getting started. So you are in a perfect place to get it all locked in and then just be done with it where you can get this on automation as you move forward. So here's the deal. I'm breaking my rules a bit right now because you all know I've had a policy for about the last year that I do not send podcast listeners to somebody else's opt-in. And I've talked about that strategy and why I do that on the show. However, this information is so important and I want you to protect yourself. So I'm making an exception. I want to encourage you to check out Bobby's mini training. It is totally free and it dives into everything you need to know about GDPR. So the video series will go over what we went over here, but at a deeper level with a lot of examples that we didn't cover because there's only so much time. So the goal of Bobby's mini training is not only to make sure that you as an online entrepreneur understand the legal requirements, but also to give you the tools and practical advice, that's what I love about it most, the practical advice you need to thrive in a GDPR world. So to get your hands on this free mini training, go to youronlinegenius.com forward slash GDPR. So youronlinegenius.com forward slash GDPR. And I'll link to it in my show notes as well. So you have all the details. Bobby, thanks again for being here. Thanks for having me. It was my pleasure. You guys have a great day and good luck and putting together everything you need to do for GDPR. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast at www.amyporterfield.com.